Hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on tech and transparency, democratizing data and empowering communities with cutting edge technologies, which is co-hosted by Esri, the Land Portal Foundation, and New America. It is my pleasure to moderate this discussion. I am Yulia Panfil, Senior Fellow and Director of New America's Future of Property Rights Program. We all know that corruption and lack of transparency are endemic in the land sector. This can range from petty corruption in land transactions to major political corruption in land management and uh, such as the illegal sale of land by public officials. New and emerging technologies have the potential to greatly increase transparency by simplifying the process of mapping, recording, and defending property rights at scale. While technology alone is insufficient to solve pernicious property rights challenges, it can be harnessed by policymakers, lawyers, surveyors, families, and communities to help stem corruption. This webinar will introduce six new technologies uh, that are described in a tool that's produced by New America and Esri. This series of prop rights tech primers is aimed at explaining in simple, accessible terms six new and emerging technologies in the land tenure and property rights space. It is my pleasure to welcome you here today, and we look forward to a dynamic discussion. Allow me to introduce our panelists. We have Tim Fella, Global Business Development Manager for Land Administration at Esri, Shreya Deb, Director of Investments at Omidyar Network India, Mustafa Issa, Field Program Director for the USAID Feed the Future Tanzania Land Tenure Assistance Program implemented by DAI Tanzania, and Milton Saunders, Manager of Mapping Services for the Jamaican Land Agency, and Renee Latour, Senior GIS Specialist for the Jamaican Land Agency. I will first begin with a brief presentation of the primers on each of these emerging technologies, and this will be followed by a dialogue among our panelists. After the first hour, we will open the discussion and give room to the participants to add questions. Please use the question feature to pose questions to the panelists. We will ensure that your questions are addressed in turn during the open discussion that follows. The Future Property Rights Program at New America works to answer the following question. Why is it that despite advances in technology and human development, a quarter of the world's population still has insecure property rights? Through our research, journalism, and convening, we bring together technologists and policymakers to shrink the gap between these two constituencies. We act as a translator between the world of drones and artificial intelligence and the world of politics, laws, and institutions. At the same time, our program aims to preempt emerging property rights challenges by thinking critically about the paradigms that govern new spaces from cyberspace to outer space. Next slide, please. As part of this effort, our program in collaboration with Esri has just released a series of prop rights tech primers aimed at explaining in simple, accessible terms, six new and emerging technologies in the land and property rights space. The motivation for these primers really came from my own search for simple, digestible literature on the topic of land technology. I couldn't find anything. Tech is advancing rapidly, and the literature is all quite long, dense, and technical. So it's difficult for policymakers, funders, and others to gain even a basic understanding of these technologies without investing massive amounts of time. We decided to team up with Esri to produce a series of short 101 style snapshots of six technologies, their strengths, limitations, areas of applicability, and existing use cases. The photo on the right of your screen is a snapshot of one of these primers. I'll introduce them very briefly, but you can peruse them in more detail on our website. So our first technology is the much discussed blockchain. For being a very poorly understood technology, blockchain has received a lot of hype and then a lot of hate. In reality, the technology is somewhere in the middle. Blockchain at its most basic is a database technology. It's a type of distributed ledger that can concurrently be accessed and updated by multiple users. So a blockchain creates a decentralized network of records that's virtually impossible to hack, 
cheat or manipulate, given that land is notorious for corruption, that's a great thing. So incorporating blockchain technology into a land registry's architecture can help stem corruption and lack of trust, and can also help data be more secure and less vulnerable to cyber attacks. But blockchain is not a cure-all. Various prerequisites, including a functional identity system, accurate and digitized records, and a trained professional community are necessary for successful adoption. Drones are a better understood technology. Essentially, a drone is a flying machine that's remotely controlled through a ground control station. Drones provide sophisticated platforms for aerial photography and mapping. That means they save on the time, cost, and complexity of conventional land surveying and can access remote and dangerous terrain. But country regulations and legal frameworks have sometimes kept drones from reaching their full potential. And while it's improving, battery life remains an issue. Next slide, please. Our next technology is dual band GPS, which is already in use in professional surveying equipment, but is now becoming available in smartphones and other mainstream devices. So most GPS enabled consumer devices like your smartphone or a tablet or a car navigation system use single frequency receivers, which are only accurate to about five meters. By contrast, dual band receivers use two different frequencies of signals to calculate positions, so they're much more accurate. Some mobile phones are starting to carry dual band GPS functionality, which means mobile mapping using these phones is significantly more accurate. You can now buy a phone for about $400 that will map with centimeter accuracy. The drawback is that this technology is not fully mainstream yet, though this is quickly becoming more common. Our next technology, machine learning, is uh, perhaps one that I'm the most excited about. Machine learning is a type of artificial intelligence that allows computers to learn and improve from past experience. The way it works is that a computer is trained on a sample data set, and then it can apply the insights it learns and, and make intelligent predictions and decisions about much larger sets of data. So for example, a computer trained on a small number of mapped parcels can then predict parcel boundaries in an unmapped area, relying on patterns that it picked up from the training data. As another example, a program trained on home valuation data from a small sample where values are known can then predict home values across a much larger unknown sample. The benefit of machine learning is scale. By automating multiple components of the property mapping, documentation, and transaction process, machine learning can vastly increase the scale and speed of property rights delivery, resource management, and land use planning. But there are drawbacks. Accuracy is not 100%, and it's possible to introduce errors into the algorithm, which are then perpetuated by the computer. Our next technology uh, is a type of digital identity called self-sovereign identity. Self-sovereign ID systems allow people to store their identifying documents, called credentials, in a secure digital wallet that preserves their privacy and is under their control. Crucially, these credentials are issued by third parties and they come with a cryptographic signature that makes them virtually impossible to fake, but easy to verify without having to contact the issuer. The most basic application of self-sovereign identity for property rights is to provide people with digital identities that they can use to interact with land administration services. However, self-sovereign identity can also help people build evidence of their property holding in the absence of formal documentation. For example, by using credentials issued by telecoms, banks, social media providers, neighbors, and others, people can prove their location history, their purchases, and other information that can be used to support a property claim. A major benefit of self-sovereign identity is that it's flexible, privacy-preserving, and gives the user control over their own data. The drawback is that it's still very nascent, and its success depends on the development of an ecosystem of credential issuers and acceptors. Our last technology is a 3D cadaster, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a cadaster that allows us to visualize the built environment in three dimensions. Given rapid global urbanization, it's easy to see why a 3D cadaster would be useful for visualizing multi-story buildings and even subterranean environments. Using 3D cadasters gives you a more accurate picture of the reality on the ground, including multiple land uses, and can lead to more accurate valuation as well. 
However, 3D cadastres are still nascent and have not been widely adopted. Land administration staff will have a learning curve in figuring out how to administer a 3D cadaster system. So that was a very quick introduction to these six exciting new technologies. I'd encourage you to explore them in more detail by visiting our website or contacting us. With this quick introduction, let's turn it over to the experts. Let me begin the conversation with Shreya Dev. Shreya, from your experience as a funder looking across multiple investments, uh, how do technologies lead to increased transparency in land governance systems? Let me share some examples. One of the projects that we funded was in a state called Orissa in Eastern India, where we use drones to create cadastral quality maps of slums or informal communities. So this was, uh, drones were used to cover over 200,000 households across the state in a space of less than one year. And imagine the kind of maps that were created. This is very different from the regular uh, cadastral map, which, uh, which is very you know, technical and looks just like some sort of a squiggly drawing to an ordinary person in the community. Now, when you use a drone and you're creating an overhead image, the entire and then print it out so that the entire community can see it they're able to engage with the map they can actually locate where their house is where their neighbor's house is where's the local pond their common space they're able to agree to the boundaries of the slum and it was an extremely involved process with a lot of buy-in from the community so in a very short span of time we were able to cover a very large number of households um i can also share another, a flip side of this of how you know, too much transparency is not desirable by, by some people. Um, so there was an experiment that was conducted where our digital ID system, Aadhaar, uh, was being linked to land records in one particular uh, district. And it was a pilot. It was meant to be voluntary disclosure by people. Most people in the district actually shared their ID and allowed the linking of their ID to the property systems. But the ones who did not were notably the largest landowners in the district because their fear was that a land administration system, which will actually link property to an individual ID, um, would actually create too much transparency around the ownership of property. It could actually even raise questions around disproportionate assets. And these owners did not want that. That's fascinating. Thank you, Shreya. Uh, Mustafa, as someone who is implementing a large land project, how can technologies lead to increased transparency in land governance systems? Uh, thank you, Uria. Uh, in Tanzania, uh, only 7% of the land is a village land, and 28% uh, is reserved land, which is water bodies, uh, uh, lot reserve, and forest reserve, and 2% is urban land. So uh, the village uh, land covers the largest portion, which is less than 10% is registered to date. So that is means uh, the, 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 the areas mapped and issued with the land title. Uh, some of the main reasons for a such small percentage of registered land in the village are the high cost of registration, uh, corruption, poor land administration system which are not transparent. So uh, from my experience taking part in implementing the USA Feed the Future mobile application to secure tenure, uh, which was uh, designing uh, a mobile application called MAST in 2015 to 2016, and also uh, uh, working in, in, in the USA Tanzania Land Tenure Assistance Program from 2016 to date in implementing and developing of innovative technologies for uh, registration of the village land using uh, MAST uh, in mapping of land parcels and also involved in the design of a web-based system which is going to track and record the post-registration transaction using the technical register and the social tenure trust. Uh, it has been proved that simple uh, cost-effective uh, technologies have increased transparency in land governance system and also reduce the cost of producing the uh, land titles and they've streamlined the process of insurance of the CCR at a scale. So uh, USAID LTA has uh, redeveloped the mask and also implemented a land registration model that is enabled to map over 70,000 land parcels and we have made it to issue over 60,000 uh, land titles in 41 villages. So, and we're having, of course, approximately equal land ownership in terms of gender ratio between women and men, which is 49.7%, 49.5% to 50.5% respectively. So, and, and this is the, uh, uh, due to the extensive 
uh, since suggestion and, and training on uh, rights to residents, uh, village leaders, youth, uh, and marginalized groups such as pastoralists and women. And most importantly, uh, their participation in the work involved in the in land registration process is made uh, for a high level of transparency. So uh, the model has brought the cost down to below uh, uh, $10 against the previous cost, which was very high cost of registration uh, of the village land, which was uh, in order of $100. So uh, using uh, simple technology such as smartphone with a simple app like Mast, uh, open source software, and also good uh, procedures has now paved the way uh, for a large scale low cost registration of land in Tanzania. Wonderful, thank you so much, Mustafa. Milton, turning over to you, as uh, somebody working at a government land agency, what are your thoughts on how new technologies can lead to increased transparency in land governance? Uh, thank you for your question, uh, Yuli. Now, effective land governance ensures equitable access to land and security of tenure. It can contribute to improvements in social, economic, and environmental conditions. And when good governance exists, decision made related to land is much more transparent. Now, good land governance can result in land administration being simplified, more accessible, and effective, but in the absence of good governance of land, there can be extensive abuse. Now, different types of technology exist, and new ones are emerging, some of which were detailed by, by Yulia in our presentation. And these can be introduced to help treat with this particular need to ensure transparency. With the application of technology, more efficiency can be brought into the process of capturing land information, and all can be provided with access to the same information in an open form and can therefore make use of it thus ensuring equity and access to land information. The application of technology also enables objectivity in identifying gaps in land registration and technology can be used to fill these gaps in a transparent way. It helps patterns that interventions such as land reform programs can be more targeted and transparent. And technology also enables more efficient updates to national cadastres, which has been our experience thereby ensuring that there is an accurate reflection of what exists on ground to the public. The question also asks for implications. So in terms of implication, when there is a lack of transparency, you can have lack of trust in the land governance system in a country or the process to ensure tenure. There's also potential for inequity in land distribution and use, corruption, which has been mentioned by some of the panelists, in land transaction, conflicts and disputes over ownership. If, however, there is transparency through the application of technology, there can be positive impl implications, which we must also highlight. And some of these include security of legitimate tenure, elimination of fraud, enhancing the trust in the systems and pro processes of the country, and also it can serve as a potential trigger for more investments and, by extension, economic development within, within the country. Thank you. Thank you, Milton. Uh, Tim, turning to you, as someone working inside of a tech company, uh, how do you see new technologies leading to increased transparency in the land sector? Thank you, Yulia. What we're finding is like new technologies are making it possible to more easily share data and to collaborate within organizations across government, as well as with citizens who might want more timely access to authoritative land administrative data, content services. And one of the ways in which um, this is happening is through the advent of web services, which is essentially a dial tone of your data. And this can be accessed through any web client. So it could be your desktop or mobile device as well. And this helps reduce the need to physically uh, move physical files around an organization and to worry about whether the data has to be, um, whether it's up to date at the end of the day. So now statutory land agencies can use these web services to answer common questions through modern maps and web applications that have been specifically designed or configured to aid public access to tax information, parcel data, property valuation data, and so on. So this not only reduces the, the staff time required to gather information, but it also improves policy making uh, public engagement and private sector provisioning of services, whether it might be utilities or something else of the same nature. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Tim. So we've just heard that technology makes land administration more efficient, accessible, and accurate. And this in turn enhances trust and transparency and even increases satisfaction within land administration agencies themselves. We also heard a really interesting example from Shreya about how some parties are more or less reluctant to uh, use land technology to increase transparency because maybe that transparency may not be of benefit to them. So let's move on to our next question. Shreya, we uh, hear about the benefits of technology, but how can it be assured that uh, you know, technologies are not used to turn communities uh, against one another and for further marginalize them? So what safeguards in both the public and private sector can be put into place to ensure that these technologies are not employed to further disadvantage vulnerable people? Thank you, Yulia. Um, I may actually have a bit of a contrarian view here, but the way I look at it is technology by itself doesn't you know, disadvantage or marginalize people. Uh, technology has the ability to reduce cost. It can actually uh, reduce the information asymmetry that often exists, uh, that often leads to this imbalance of power. Um, but if people's intentions aren't right, then they can misuse technology. So you need the right set of people who, who will understand what is the starting position of a community, uh, what are their requirements, articulate what needs to be done. Uh, so for example, you need to acknowledge that if people are living in remote locations, then internet is likely to be bad. Or, um, or you know, a, a database which is storing personal data can be vulnerable and you, to, you need to put in the processes around it, right? So if you, if you go in for an immutable blockchain sort of a database, uh, once you put in a transaction which is you know inaccurate or fake data and becomes really hard to change that in future so acknowledging these the realities the starting positions and you need to design the process around it so in fact I mean I would actually like to hear I mean is how can technology by itself actually lead to marginalizing people um, are there you know, other examples of this would love to actually learn more thank you Shreya for that provocative response let me pose the same question to Mustafa. Uh, Mustafa, uh, what safeguards in both the public and private sector can be put in place to ensure that technologies aren't employed to further disadvantage more marginalized people? Uh, of course, from, from our case, uh, the development and designing of the technologies for that is mass and trust, if considered the existing procedures, uh, regulations, uh, policies and registration, which are the guiding, uh, which are guiding land registration in Tanzania. So uh, explicitly, uh, the laws provide protection for the land rights for marginalized and vulnerable groups. That is, uh, women, youth, and pastoralists. So, uh, to safeguard users' interest uh, during the design of mass and trust, uh, there was a full involvement of the users. That is, the government officials, uh, private sector, academia, they them themselves and the other institution involved in the land uh, sector in Tanzania. So uh, LT and the government are very sensitive of, of maintaining uh, uh, the integrity of the land data. So uh, during the design of these technologies, we, uh, where we did make sure that uh, land data are compatible with the government land administration database and information now are transferred regularly from, from, from the local uh, based database uh, to and, and stored and back up to the national national level. Thank you, Mustafa. Milton, uh, we'd like to hear from you on this question. Um, how can we make sure that technology allows for responsible use? Okay, yeah, that's, to some extent I share, share this view. But the expectation is always for responsible use to be made of, of technology. Um, though this is the idea, it's, it's not always the case, and as such, there can be abuse. That and marginalized communities become further affected in a negative way. And the emphasis here is on the abuse of the technology. Now, because of this, it is necessary to put in safeguards to mitigate and be So there are some safeguards that can be put in place, and I'll try to highlight some. Um, one could be the use of standards, which are enforced in land management systems for workflows. So these can be further supported by which ensures that decisions are not arbitrary and that there is a clear reference system to determine how a land-related transaction is completed. The second one that 
could be contemplated as implementation of automated data reviews to sort of the um, manual checks where those exist. Um, and these would ensure some amount of verification to transaction and ensure that they are in keeping with, with standard operating procedures. And another significant one is to ensure that um, we can implement stringent penalties for abuse of um, or the negative manipulation of technology. Great. Thank you, Milton. And um, the audio was a bit spotty, so I just want to repeat a couple of the main points that Milton had made in case um, others were also um, having spotty audio. Milton spoke about how the expectation is always for responsible use of technology, but that's not always the case. He spoke about the uh, benefit of using standards which are enforced in land, ministry, uh, land management systems by workflows, as well as automated data reviews and uh, potentially stringent penalties for abuse or negative manipulation of technology. Um, thank you, Milton. Tim, uh, from your perspective, what safeguards in both the public and private sector can be put into place to ensure that these technologies are not employed to further disadvantage vulnerable people? Yeah, sure. So I think there's no doubt that technologies are being embraced by communities across the world. Uh, I think if you just look at the rapid adoption of smartphones and mobile banking across the developing world, which is, a, I think, a good example. But in the land sector, the adoption of new technologies can similarly offer benefits. But of course, we have to think about certain safeguards being put in place. And some examples are, for instance, when leveraging mobile devices or drones for field data collection of land rights information, perhaps as part of a first registration process. It's important that communities be informed of the objectives of the effort, uh, the process involved, and how the data at the end of the day will be used. Um, to the extent possible, it's also great if you can involve the communities in the, the process of collecting the data itself. Um, I know uh, from an ESRI perspective, we have partnered with a number of organizations, including the, the Cadasta Foundation, Cadasta International, to develop digital tools and workflows to support participatory capture of land rights information. And then on top of that, I'd also add that I think it's important that once the data is collected, that any changes to that data be tracked through user identities and roles within an organization, and that any information that's eventually published at the end of the day be treated carefully and that the proper protections being put in place for particularly personally identifiable inf information of those uh, whose data that's being handled. Wonderful, thank you, Tim. So we've heard from our panelists that the design process is key to ensuring that uh, new technology advantages vulnerable communities and doesn't put them at risk. Stakeholders have to be involved from the inception of the project. We've also heard about the importance of the use of standards and of um, you know, differentiating between different types of data, for example, treating personally identifiable information with extreme care. But we've also heard a bit of pushback on the idea that technology in, a, in and of itself can be pernicious towards vulnerable communities. And this idea that tech is really a tool and it depends on who's wielding it. So with that, we'll move on to our next question. Shreya, um, can you share examples based on your experiences of how technologies have benefited marginalized communities? Sure, Julia. Um, let me start by talking about uh, the Forest Rights Act in India. Um, this is a landmark act which allows indigenous communities to claim title to the land that they are occupying as long as they can prove that they were farming that land as of 31st December 2005. So in the first few years since this act came into being, people were scrambling all over the place, collect, collecting various pieces of paper, eviction notices or fine receipts that they had got from the forest department just to prove that at, you know, before 2005, they were actually on that land and occupying that land. So in 2008, there was a judgment passed by the Gujarat High Court, which allowed the use of satellite imagery. So if you can take a historical image and show that that plot of land was not really forest, there was no tree cover there, but it was actually inhabited by people, you can show that they were farming that land. That was a good enough proof to show that they were occupying that land. And thanks to this, millions of indigenous people have now been able to actually claim title rights to their forest land. So I think this was a great example of how technology can really empower uh, some very, very vulnerable people. Um, another example is a company called uh, Meridia that works in Ghana. 
um, in Ghana about you know there are lots of smallholder uh, cocoa farmers and nearly 80% of those farms have never ever been mapped and there are no records which exist and there have been multiple projects funded by uh, many multilateral bilateral institutions um, which haven't made much progress over the years so Meridia uses a simple handheld device um, they are able to train their local field staff to just walk the boundaries it's very similar to mast walk the boundaries and map these cocoa farms and generate land documents for the cocoa farmers and it, within one year meridia was able to map close to 2000 plots so these are just some of the great examples of how technology can really be used to help some very marginalized people wonderful thank you shreya and i i want to point out that I found it really fascinating, the Gujarat example, because there it was really uh, not just the use of the technology, but the innovation mindset of the Gujarat High Court that sort of allowed for this new evidence to be used. So, you know, as uh, I think Shreya, you were saying before, it's not only dependent on the technology, tech is just a tool, it's also who's using that technology and um, making decisions based on it. Uh, so Milton, from your perspective, can you share some examples of how technologies have benefited marginalized communities? Sure, Yuna. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind is a committee that was set up to map all informal communities, or as we call it in Jamaica, squatter settlements. Um, maps are prepared to determine the area and extent of each settlement using imagery and GIS tools um, were used and were incorporated in very ways to assist in decision making. Um, GIS tools were also used to control the age and the extent of communities by determining the number of persons in each, each of these communities and which legal policies they were, they were situated on. Uh, it assisted the process of acquiring the policy from the legitimate owner so ownership could be legally transferred to occupants. Another example in Jamaica is born up in a land administration and management program, or what we call LAMP, that has been in place for a few years now. And it is now being led by the National Land Agency. I recognize that is a hindering factor to registration or regularization, including marginalized communities. The objective of this program is to increase the percentage of registered properties across the country and regularize tenure property owners at a subsidized cost. Technology is being used from this exercise to map the locations to get addressed and to ensure that there is transparent maintenance and updating of the passes associated with these areas. And I can, I can also make reference to the fact that here in Jamaica we're at the early stage of making use of drones for mapping, having invested recently in the technology. The intention is to make use of online area vehicles to map areas, including informal settlements and areas which may be difficult to traverse and where marginalized communities may exist. It should also serve to support the build out of a national cadastral map and uh, 3D cadastral, both of which will allow for better management of land records and modeling of the realities as they exist on ground. Wonderful, thank you, Milton. So uh, Milton spoke about several tools that can be uh, used to help squatter communities in Jamaica, including uh, GIS tools and potentially the use of drones to map areas that are hard to access. Uh, let's move on to you, Tim. Can you share some examples based on your experiences of how technologies can benefit marginalized communities? Sure. Uh, one example I'd like to share, uh, I think Shreya was alluding to this earlier, but in Odisha, India, the Kadasta Foundation partnered with the, the state government and Tata Trust to deliver land certification to over 125,000 households just over the past year. And if you look at the process, it included use of drones to capture high resolution imagery of slum areas and then mobile devices to draw the boundaries of properties, capture survey information from each household. Essentially, the, the technologies involved in the process helped it be more accurate, transparent, uniform, uh, and efficient. Uh, another example that comes to mind is um, from the uh, South America. We have the Amazon Conservation Trust, 
which is teaching indigenous groups from 11 different nations on how to use GIS technologies to protect their land and their ways of life in the Amazon. And they're using technology to record tribal boundaries um, as well as the resources within those boundaries and ultimately to support uh, participatory planning together with these communities. Thank you, Tim. So we've heard multiple specific examples from Gujarat to Ghana to the Amazon of how technology can benefit marginalized communities. We've heard that it's benefited informal owners or squatters. We've heard a lot in particular about drones and also mobile mapping as tools that can be widely used by marginalized groups. Um, turning to our next question, Mustafa, a big debate right now is over the ownership, use, and control of data. So what should be done with all this data that's being collected with these new technologies? How can you ensure that government data is open while at the same time communities are protected? Uh, in so far as the link tenure systems uh, is concerned, the spatial and attribute data which are collected at the feed level are uh, primarily uh, aimed at the issuance of the lien titles. So, and also the management of the post-registration transactions, such as mortgages, transfer, subdivision of land, inheritance, etc. So, uh, but the hard copies of land data are stored at the district and village level for easy access at the village level. But also, uh, we as LTA, we have managed to design a computerized uh, land administration system, uh, which is called Trust, whereby uh, all land data can be easily accessed by the public for official search during mortgage uh, or sale or purchase, but also the, 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 the land owners are contributed to contributing a, a very small fee uh, for, uh, for such kind of transactions. Interesting. Uh, Tim, from your perspective, what should be done with all of this data that's being collected? How do we strike the balance between openness and privacy? Well, in my view, the data that's collected should be maintained as a, a system of record. Um, and this means leveraging efficient, well-managed workflows, systems that manage data integrity and security, and capabilities that deliver modern information products and services to stakeholders, taxpayers, citizens. What we do know is that land ownership data is really far behind in its level of openness as compared to other data sets such as government budgets, uh, national statistical data. This is evidenced by um, indicators that have been put out by the Open Data Barometer and the Global Open Data Index. Whereas I'd say in the past, publishing geospatial data used to be a very time-consuming, costly process. It's much more, I think, more of a routine part of daily operations for many cadastral organizations. And some of the initial fears over the loss of revenue from the provisioning of this data have in many ways been replaced by the potential return on investment associated with improved data management. And the cost savings from eliminating the, the workload associated with redundant requests from multiple government agencies, um, including you know, fulfilling data orders, collecting and accounting for related fees, um, is quite substantial. So in many ways, governments stand to gain from um, public, put, you know, putting the data out there because it helped increase land market activity, uh, potential for tax collection and the broader economic development that can be spurred from making cadastral data more more readily accessible to different stakeholders. Great, thanks Tim. So we heard about the importance of data being both accessible to the government for its core services and value added services, but also to citizens and that citizen privacy should be protected. It's hard to strike the right balance. Tim also touched on how advances in technology are actually helping us make data more open in a responsible way that maintains revenue flows for government agencies. So um, let's uh, turn to our next question. Uh, tech is cool, but what about the uh, enabling environment? Shreya, uh, what are the enabling conditions that would allow governments and communities to effectively use technology to increase tenure security? So like you rightly said, right, tech is cool, but it's only 20% of the solution, I think. I mean, about the 80% is just people, people having the right processes and then you know, people all over again. So technology can help collect data, view data, it increases transparency, it reduces information asymmetry, it reduces cost, 
But if you really want people to have more tenure security, if that's what the end goal is, I think that will only come when the formal government system starts to absorb all the data that is being generated with all these processes, uh, absorbs this data, makes it a part of their own business as usual, updates these land records and property registries. So that mindset within the government to not treat this as some standalone project, which is, you know, being funded and when the funding goes, the project shuts down, but really make it part of their business as usual. Great, thank you, Shreya. Mustafa, you're on the ground working with the government and with communities to implement these new technologies. What are the enabling conditions that you see that would allow these technologies to be effectively adopted? Uh, of course, based on experience in implementing two uh, projects in Tanzania, I think uh, political will is one of the critical uh, issues, of course. Uh, cost effective of the technologies because people, they want cheap technology so that they can use it. Uh, user friendly of technologies. You want technology that uh, the villager they can use, they can participate in implementing uh, <clears throat> land administration. Also the security of uh, uh, data collected from the field. Also, these are the very critical that government are very concerning on it. Accessibility and transparency of the data. Uh, restriction from the fraud, of course, and corruption in land administration system in Tanzania also one, that one of the very critical issues to be considered, but also the use of open standard, uh, open source modality, the use of maybe uh, uh, QGIS instead of ArcGIS, the using of mass and trust technology, which is uh, all, uh, uh, open software, also infrastructure, uh, human resource, and also training requirement for the district land officers. These are the very critical issues in Tanzania, of course, as long as uh, land administration is concerned. Wonderful. Thank you, Mustafa. Renee, from your perspective, what are the enabling conditions that would allow governments and communities to effectively use new technologies to increase tenure security? Personally, I think it's important to ensure that everyone has equal access to the same information, because if access is distorted, it can lend itself to the creation of issues of inequality. Technology can help to solve this in different ways. So through technology, land-related data, for example, can be made available. Government protocol can assist by ensuring that the requisite enabling conditions to ensure the technology is used exist. So some of the some of that the government can do, um, or that it can look at as enablers at the community level, would include, for example, ensuring that there is extensive internet penetration within the country and there is access within and throughout the country. Also, making land records available electronically will help us because as an example for Jamaica, what we have done is we successfully made a web map available 24 seconds to anyone who talks to us who has an interest in land. This product is called Elan Jamaica and we've registered transactions upwards of 1,000 per month. Um, in addition to that, at the community level, we could look at, at the government level, encouraging um, affordability of the access devices. So things like computers, tablets, mobile devices, if most of these, if not all, are within the reach of the population, or they can have access and ownership, then they will have uh, information to the to that to the information that will be available on these devices. And uh, for areas that would not have good internet penetration, what we could look at is having centralized access points or hotspots. And so people can probably go to a regional office, a kiosk, something of that nature and be able to get information from a reliable source for land tenure information. So um, there are other things that the government can do to specific state agencies and there are six specific two examples. For us at the National Land Agency in Jamaica, we have something called a property statistics app. This app shows the level of land registration by parish. Um, this is then used by the government to determine the percentage of registration for each state or administrative boundary. And this information 
was being used at the policy level to determine, for example, what land we need to focus on for increasing registration in a financial period for an administrative boundary. Secondly, the National Land Agency supports our tax administration department by maintaining an online portal. And this online portal allows, again, anyone with access to, to simple queries for land ownership information, as well as property tax payment history. So these collectively can help to, in different areas at the government level and at the community level. Wonderful. Thank you, Renee. So I just wanted to kind of, uh, you know, highlight one thing, Renee, that you said that I thought was really important, which is that you have to ensure that everyone has access to that same data and the same technology to ensure that uh, it's equitably used. So uh, you spoke about things like uh, infrastructure, internet penetration, and uh, affordable access to devices such as computers and tablets. And you spoke a bit about Jamaica's um, efforts to boost this through, for example, centralized access points or hotspots or portals that can be accessed by people who may not have great internet or have access to these devices. Um, so turning to Tim, what are the enabling conditions that you see that would allow governments and communities to effectively use technology to increase their tenure security? I think one of the, the most important enabling conditions is leadership to think outside the box and I think a, a clear vision on how technology can be applied to do things differently. Um, without this, I you know, see organizations tend to get stuck in institutional inertia and the way things have always been done. But if you do have that leadership um, and it exists with a clear vision, then it's important to plan and identify the resources required to use and sustain the technology for the stated goals. And finally, the, the staff implementing the vision also need the skills and the incentives to exec execute upon it at the end of the day. Thanks, Tim. So we've heard that it's about political will, leadership, and vision. It's not just about the tech, it's also about the people and the processes. And it's also about basic infrastructure like internet connections. Uh, let's move on to our next question. Shreya, what are the most common mistakes that you see from governments and others who are trying to adopt new technologies? So some things that come to mind, um, you know, people, the first thing that people want to do is spend money on hardware because it's so much easier to do. You have something that you can touch and feel in your hand. So let's just go out and buy uh, mobile phones and tablets for everyone. So we're not, they don't really think through what else is required. Um, the second is, you know, just trying to adopt technology. If it requires too much deviation from business as usual, um, you know, government officials, people, they have a certain way of working. They're used to a certain way. They will resist change. So if, if you expect too much change in processes, then the technology will not get adopted. Um, and lastly, often governments, you know, just like how Tim mentioned, the, they lack the vision. They don't think through what all process changes could be required. I mean, about 10 years ago, we had this major, you know, project where cities created these beautiful maps. They used high resolution imagery. They had detailed slum maps, household level information and so on. And now all of that data is obsolete. Um, and they did not think through how, uh, what is required to ensure that the data is constantly updated at a, at a regular frequency. So all of that is now sitting somewhere. It's a huge waste of public uh, resources. Um, and you know, it's in, who, who can blame the technology for it? The te technology was beautiful. They just didn't think through the process. Great, thank you, Shreya. Uh, Mustafa, what are the most common mistakes that you see in trying to adopt technology? Uh, I think if uh, the governments or, or, or private sector are trying to uh, adopt a new technology without having uh, uh, any uh, required uh, legal framework in place to support such a technology, that might be a challenge. But also uh, the fear of the security of the collected data by even testing it or implementation. So I think that is also the point. Uh, lack of proper piloting uh, of the technologies. We need to know the lesson learns. We need to know what works, what not good, what's work, what does not work. So through the pilot may, may, may come up with this kind of uh, 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 issues, but also lack of community engagement in obtaining support of, for implementation of the technology. For me, I think those are the key mistakes that 
government or private sector can make. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Mustafa. Renee, moving over to you, uh, what are some of the co common mistakes that you see in trying to adopt land technologies? Um, in responding to this question, one quick point to things like including the end user at the end of the project, which invariably results in absence of inclusion and user buy-in. And we see that as one of the, it's recorded as one of the main reasons why technological projects fail globally. So when the end user is integrated in the process, the project by itself benefits from their suggestions for efficiency and inclusion of new features that sometimes the developer didn't think about. Also, sometimes we have an insistence on implementing all the new features at once instead of incrementally and experience has shown at least from where I sit, where incremental changes have lowered the negative effects on the end user and has, and as well as turnaround time, and also has positive effects on training. Um, finally, I'll probably look at not getting enough details on the technology and ensuring that it fits the local situation before moving to the stage of implementation. Many systems that are used locally require some amount of customization. So it's important to determine or to make a determination as to what is required as it relates to customization and what can be accommodated in the technology and in the system. So there's a clear outline as to what changes are needed at the local level these um, procedural changes, legislative changes, things of that nature. So we've recently uh, looked at a project where we're implementing it and we realized that the technology requires electronic signatures. But by looking at it uh, holistically, we could see that we will need to make legislative amendments to accommodate uh, electronic signatures, for example. And so by doing it in that manner, you'll be able to benefit from having the supporting details in place before the, the technology is implemented. Wonderful. Thank you, Renee. And uh, finally, Tim, from your perspective, what do you see as the most common mistakes from those who are trying to adopt these technologies? Well, I think uh, my fellow panelists covered this quite well. So I think the only thing I would add is that I think one of the common mistakes I've seen is that there's a lack of long-term planning to sustain the technology. And this means, you know, budgeting for continuous training as well as the software and hardware maintenance and support out into the future. Without that, oftentimes the technology um, becomes out of date or um, has problems functioning after a certain amount of time. Right. So uh, we've heard a whole host of lessons learned, everything from overspending on hardware to not updating legislation to uh, what Mustafa spoke about, this expert complex of thinking that only the highly trained professionals can do the job, not implementing a user-centered design process, lack of long-term planning. Um, all of these things can result in uh, not being as successful in adopting new technologies. So we'll move on to our final question. We've heard a lot uh, about mobile mapping and about drones in particular, uh, but not so much about some of the newer technologies that have been described in some of the primers. So I'll open this up to any of the panelists. Would uh, any of the panelists like to uh, say a few words about any uh, work that they're doing with any of these other technologies and how, or uh, kind of take a stab at describing how some of these new technologies could potentially be applied. Um, maybe uh, I can... Oh, go may ahead. I? Yes, yeah. please. Okay, now I can just share one example of, um, it was a project that we did in the city of Bangalore. Um, and what we were trying to do is, can we use machine learning on uh, really high resolution satellite imagery to detect slums in the city? So it was quite interesting. Um, so we had a team on the ground which had done the ground truthing data and 
and, and then another team which was running the algorithms on the satellite imagery and so it was the reason we were trying interested in seeing is because the entire slums um, landscape is so dynamic and slums keep popping up and disappearing um, and nobody especially officials uh, government officials have no idea where these slums are or how many slums are there so one of the uh, findings of that study was that while the government records showed there are close to 600 slum settlements across the city the machine was able to detect 2000 slum settlements so there was this huge gap and this is something that only the machines are able to do if you can't like send a, an army onto the ground to kind of find all these slums there great thank you very much shreya uh, would any of the other panelists like to chime in yeah julia i'd just uh add that you know on the 3d cadaster side we're seeing increasing interest um particularly from countries that are very quickly urbanizing. Um, so if you look at uh, particularly parts of Asia where they have dense, complex um, urban environments where you're dealing with uh, many instances, sometimes overlapping rights. So you think about the built environment and high rises as well as subterranean rights and land uses. So being able to manage all those rights in an authoritative way um, and also being able to accurately capture and maintain the, the property boundaries and related attributes tied to those properties is, is really critical. Um, but also I think with the 3D cadastre, it also opens up opportunities for uh, improved planning, visualization of the, the built environment. Um, so we are definitely seeing, I think, increasing interest and movement in that direction of a 3D cadastre. Great. Well, thank you to the panelists. We'll now uh, move into the Q&A portion of the session. So a reminder to the participants that you have a uh, question feature in your GoToWebinar browser. So please uh, ask your questions through that feature. Um, our first question um, comes uh, to, uh, we'll pose this, uh, maybe Shreya can kick us off and we can see if anyone else wants to also jump in. So we've heard about, uh, you know, how fake or inaccurate data can marginalize people uh, deliberately or otherwise, uh, not so much discussed in this webinar, but we know that this is kind of a discourse uh, societally. And Shreya, you rightly pointed out that you know, tech is sort of a neutral tool that really depends uh, based on who is using it, on whether it's used for good or for bad, or whether it's correctly used or effectively used. Uh, so this um, participant is challenging this a little bit and saying that uh, you can't really remove uh, the technology from scrutiny by stating that it depends on the user because all technology is designed by people. So um, to build further on this question, how do we ensure that technology is designed in such a way as to be um, the most equitable? Okay, that's a great point. Um, I think I think that the, as a starting point, yes, it's important to acknowledge that uh, you know different communities may have different starting points and therefore technology need whatever platform you are designing um, needs to take that into account in as a part of the design principles um, so for example one of the things that we're talking about in india uh, we're talking about there's a need for um, what we call as public digital platforms there are a huge amount of data that the government different government departments have um, and we're actually leaving the thinking around how can you structure these um, public digital platforms um, so that you know you can use uh, it you can have a community around it so can you use um, principles like it should be open source it should be you know modular interoperable uh, so and all those uh, you know create a community around it that makes it uh, easily so that people can also take a look at what is the tech stack that is getting built and can suggest and build improvements around it um, and one of the other things that we are promoting is that whenever you think about building a tech platform it there needs to be privacy by you know 
design. So the design principles need to think right from the beginning how to mean how to protect people's privacy, especially around personally identifiable sensitive information. So um, I guess yeah, as you as you start building a platform, keep in mind some of these uh, vulnerabilities which are possible, and put that as a part of the design process. Great, thank you so much, Shreya. Would anyone else, any of the other panelists, like to chime in? Yeah, of course, uh, uh, from my experience, I think uh, there is a need of the data to be sent to to the villagers, to the to the residents themselves, so that they, that they can get a chance to review, uh, to correct the data, and use the data, of course. So uh, we, as LTA, whenever we collect the data, we send them back to the villager themselves for a period of 14 days so that they can get a chance to review their data, to correct some information, and also collecting back to, uh, to, 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 to the office for final uh, correction before, before even issuing the, the titles. So I think sharing to the communities is necessary. Great, thank you, Mustafa. Would anyone else like to chime in? Okay, let's move on to our next question. And Mustafa, I'll uh, pose this to you first, but again, anyone else can chime in. Uh, so this question is about sustainability. We're introducing all of these new technologies, but how do we build capacity of the local land actors to make sure that they can directly manage these technologies and databases? Uh, from our experience, of course, as, as, as I was talking earlier, uh, Yuria, uh, whenever we design the technologies, the key actors need to participate. So, uh, for instance, during the designing of mobile application, MAST, and also uh, the trust, which is the web-based system, uh, the land officers, uh, 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 the villager themselves participated in the designing. And also, we are following, we are follow, following the legal framework which guiding the uh, rent registration in Tanzania. So uh, when you, you, you use the villagers, when you use the land officers to design such technologies, I think it's easy for them to use it uh, in future. And also even in the course of implementation, some of the projects like uh, they hire the staff to implement the job, but if the villagers themselves do implement it, if the, uh, the government officials themselves participate in, in implementation, uh, uh, and also using those technology, I think even after the wind up of the project, they can proceed in, in the, in, in the technologies are being sustainable. Great, thank you, Mustafa. Does anyone else want to chime in on that question? Yeah, I'll chime in. I, you know, what I've seen, and I think I commented on this earlier in one of my responses, but I think it's important that the, the leadership within these organizations that are adopting these newer technologies Again, be thinking long term and be planning long term um, in terms of uh, training, continuous training of staff, opportunities, or identifying opportunities for growth within the organization. I think being able to identify quick wins that can help generate buzz within the government and with the public, which can help garner support and ultimately budget for, for out years. I think that's all critical for the sustainability of it. Wonderful, thank you, Tim. Uh, so let me pose this next question to Milton and Renee. Uh, working inside a government land agency, uh, the question is, uh, what is the cost benefit analysis that you adopt when uh, you're thinking about whether to adopt these new technologies? I know that uh, the Jamaica land agency has looked at several new technologies recently. So how do you think through uh, the costs and benefits before you take one on. Hi, uh, thanks for that question, uh, Yulia. Um, we do think in dollars and cents. Uh, so one of the first things we would look at is in terms of what a particular technology would bring to the table in terms of returns, monetary returns. Of course, we put that against the cost to the agency in acquiring um, such technology. So if the cost outweighs the returns, then we would be careful about implementation or taking on that technology. But if we see where um, the returns to the agency and also the benefits that it will bring to the community, uh, 
that we also be looking at are things like time and quality of data because those will really factor in in making a decision or determination if we are looking at multiple options. Great, thank you, Renee. Would any of the other panelists like to jump in on the cost and benefit analysis that you look at when adopting new technologies? Okay, uh, next question is to Tim. Uh, as you know, the US lacks a national cadaster. Uh, so what lessons and advice, uh, based on your experience, do you have uh, for, um, you know, when you're speaking with other governments around their cadasters, um, what advice do you have for adopting a national cadaster in their respective countries? Or do you not provide that advice and in fact you advocate for a more decentralized service? I, I wouldn't say we advocate for any particular direction, but you know, from a technology provider um, view, I think it's easier now to be able to accommodate both options, whether you have a national kind of centralized cadaster or if you have a, a decentralized where perhaps cadasters maintain at a regional level or municipal level. Um, one of the technologies that I, I mentioned earlier in one of my responses was, you know, web services um, and being able to now leverage web services and kind of a distributed um, uh, architecture in many ways allows for cadastres at a subnational level to easily share and to integrate that data at a national level. Um, so it's no longer a technical barrier to be able to um, maintain cadastral data at a subnational level and be able to integrate that to a national level. I think it more comes down to legal um, a legal issue and how they, you know, the, the country or jurisdictions wants, wants to manage it. So we don't provide any particular advice one way or another for how a country should go about it, but we can, I think, accommodate a variety of different approaches to um, how that data is managed and shared and integrated, um, whether it's a decentralized or up to a, a national level. Great, thank you, Tim. Um, and this question, uh, why don't we uh, again pose it first to uh, Renee and Milton, but really I want to open this up to all the panelists because I think this is a really important question. And the question is, um, how do you ensure that public institutions have the capacity to use and maintain these new technologies? Uh, what happens when experts leave, for example, to join the private sector and take their capacity with them? Um, you know, how do you uh, do, do you deploy any sort of continuous training or how do you ensure that uh, your staff are up to date on new technologies? Someone is trained and has a skill and is able to contribute, you have to guard against lo losing that person. Um, so what we do on our end is to ensure that we have continuous training. Uh, we also have a system, an understood system, so where it is possible, you know, um, um, an, an expert with an understudy, so as to ensure that um, whatever one knows, the other one will know um, at least 90% of that. And so if you lose one, um, the business is able to continue because there's somebody else who can, can do the same thing. Um, so, so those are some of the things that, that, that we do on our side uh, to try and mitigate against things like that. Also, um, documentation we found to be very critical because it's one thing to be trained and have all the information in your head but it's another thing when you are able to have clear documentation. So someone who has absolutely nothing, no knowledge of the, of the technology or the system 
independent documentation and be able to step in someone's shoes if they should be in office. Great, thank you, Renee. Would any of the other uh, panelists like to jump in on this one? Okay, uh, next question uh, I'd like to pose to uh, Mustafa first and then anyone else can jump in. We spoke a lot about how technology can be used for mapping and land registration, but what about land use planning and zoning? Um, how can new technologies be used to help with land use planning? Uh, of course, from uh, our experience, uh, we are using the new. We are using mobile application. We are using MAST to uh, do prepare the land use planning because uh, uh, land use is all about the uh, demarcation and, and the allocation of the village land for for different uses. So uh, technology like MAST or Startup Image can be used to allocate grazing areas. Can be used to allocate uh, uh, residential areas. Only challenge, of course. In Tanzania, uh, the land use plan is prerequisite uh, for first registration, but the only issue is uh, preparation of the land use plan is very expensive. But we, as a project, we have tried to, uh, uh, to, 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 to to reduce the number of days. We are preparing a uh, land use plan for only 10 days. And also, we have managed to split the plan team because there is a specific team uh, which are, uh, are designated for preparation of the land use plan at the district level. So we've managed to split that team into two and we have managed to prepare land, two land use plans simultaneously. So still, there's a room for using uh, advanced technology in preparing by demarcating the designated area for different uses. Great, thank you, Mustafa. Um, Tim, I know that Esri does quite a bit of work uh, around zoning. Perhaps you could uh, tell us a few words about how new technologies can help with the zoning process. Yeah, so I mean, we touched upon 3D and the, the tech primers that we worked on together with New America. And I think as we start thinking about the, the 3D environment and 3D data, it opens up opportunities to more or less create a digital twin of the, the real world environment, which facilitates, um, I think, planning activities because it can allow you to um, play with different scenarios in terms of um, buildings, building size, height, um, and also kind of interactively be able to understand its impact on different key performance indicators which may be related to um, the number of um, people that can be accommodated in a particular building or a particular part of the city or the number of jobs that may be created by altering the height within a kind of 3D environment and playing with these different scenarios. Um, another example, I can think, you know, related to another piece of technology that was discussed in the primers is really related to machine learning and artificial intelligence. And we've seen it being applied to classify land use at large scale. Um, and in addition to that, being able to look at kind of past land use changes and to, you know, based off of that data to pre, uh, predict future land use changes that may be occurring. And with that information, being able to better plan um, how you'd want that essentially that growth to occur over time. Great, thank you, Tim. The next question is for Shreya. Uh, in India, are there any efforts being made by the government to um, democratize real estate data. So uh, the example that this participant gives is, uh, for example, developing an area-based rental index to the benefit of the community. Okay, from the government side, efforts are, I would say, mixed. So for example, if you think about uh, just the basic data around uh, property registrations of any transaction, whether it's a lease transaction or a sale transaction, actually all of the data is available in the public. It's just that it's not easily accessible. People don't know where to look for it, but the data is really out there. And uh, there are a bunch of companies who are now scraping through the data and coming up with their own models around it. Uh, an example of this index, uh, not this particular index that I know of, um, the housing bank, uh, 
the regulator had tried to come up with an index around house prices. Um, but again, the way it was done within a government department wasn't really publicized. So I don't think people it, it saw much uptake among common people. So um, long answer to cut it short, uh, from the government efforts, perhaps not too much around it. No, no deliberate efforts, may I, if I may put it that way. A lot of the data is publicly available. Great, thank you, Shreya. Uh, so this next question, uh, I think uh, probably Renee, Milton, and Tim may be best positioned to answer. Uh, so I'll start with uh, you and then others can chime in. And this is a question around um, cybersecurity. Um, so uh, how do you ensure that, for example, cadastral data in GIS databases is uh, not hacked? Uh, or uh, how do you ensure uh, that um, uh, drone data is um, secure? Well, I'll go first. Um, it is something that we are working at. It's, um, we know that the potential is there and it is a high risk and it would have dire consequences for the integrity of our data. So we've done very basic things at the at the onset. So we look at authentication and different types of authentication to ensure the right individual has the right level of access to the information. We've also looked at auditing. So there's a very robust audit trail on all our data sets. We know who accessed what, when. And we've also looked at uh, things like uh, maybe hashing. So if um, there's any change in the condition or, or there's any change at all in any data set, they, there's something within the, the metadata or we can do information having some change and who made it and when. We also look at things like having dual sites. So if one thing goes down or the integrity is compromised somewhere, we have some a complete data set whereby we can match against it. So we are looking at things from maybe a few different perspectives. But holistically, we're hoping that these can help us to protect ourselves because we know the threat and the risk exists. And I can also add you know, that um, from the personal side, the, the National Land Agency had looked at instruction and decided to take on board a, a network security specialist. Um, so that's an example of, of us taking this very seriously. Yeah, and if I were to add um, some input, I would say that, you know, because Esri works with governments at all scales across the globe, um, that obviously security is really embedded within the core of our technology, um, which is why a lot of governments around the world are using it. Um, oftentimes, they're, you know, very sensitive data, in, including cadastral data. But on top of the the kind of security built into the, the architecture of the, the technology. Um, we've also made it possible that each of the, the users within your organization have their own identity. Um, so when they log in to um, access or to edit any data, it's tied to your identity and what roles or privileges that you've been given within your organization. So uh, based off you know, your identity and those roles, maybe you can only view certain data uh, maybe you can only edit certain types of data or publish certain types of data. And then on top of that, there's um, editing tracking built in um, to the technology as well. So you can always go back to understand when an edit took place and who made that edit um, and so on. So there's a variety of different layers and ways in which security has been built into the, the, the technology. Wonderful. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Shreya, back to you for this next question. Which private sector actors do you see investing in these technologies and why? Uh, and the second part of this question is, do you see any sort of a conflict of interest 
in the private sector using these technologies for land surveying and mapping. So if you're talking about the technologies in which private sectors, I mean, the drones, for example, um, a lot of that work was done actually by the private sector. Um, and in a way, it's actually good to have uh, many of these players. Um, there was a good healthy competition. We actually got good quality output coming out of it. Um, so we didn't really find any conflict of interest, at least. So on the on the drone side of it, or even around, even if you have to think about, say, a land administration system, should a private sector player be involved in it? I think absolutely. Um, and I don't. Uh, so I can give you an example. In India, the you know for many years, getting a passport was like it could take you a year, maybe even two years, to get yourself a passport. Um, but over the last few years, they've outsourced it to a private sector. Today, I can get a passport in like one day. Um, because the entire process is given to a private sector, but the final validation is still done by a government official. So you can figure out parts which can be carved out and given to a private sector because they can do it much more efficiently. And there could be certain parts which I'd say around validation, signatures, sign-offs, which the government can still hold on to to ensure the veracity of it. So yeah, absolutely you can see private sector playing a big role. Thanks, Shreya. Um, Tim, as the private sector representative, I don't know if you want to chime in on this one. Well, I mean, we we build technology that's used by both the public and the private sector as well as nonprofits globally. And I would say that, you know, the, the private sector has almost always played a role in the land sector, uh, if you look back in history. And, you know, it, it, there's a continuum in terms of the level of involvement that they have um, within the, the, the land sector. It could be on one end, um, you know, private surveyors surveying property, you know, that, and that survey plans eventually, you know, handed over to government. Um, it could be notaries, um, but then you look at the other end of the spectrum, and it could be, you know, some of these examples that you're seeing, for instance, in, in parts of Australia where they're selling off, you know, the, the registry and as being operated by a, a private company. So there's a variety of ways and degrees to which the private sector um, can be involved, and I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing for them to be involved um, in delivering certain types of services. In some in some instances, they may be able to deliver higher quality and more efficient services for the the public at the end of the day. Great, thank you, Tim. Uh, next question is for Mustafa. So, uh, Mustafa, you spoke a little bit about this, um, you know, kind of inferiority complex between uh, the community members who are adopting your technology and the professional uh, land officials who may feel that these community members, you know, aren't, um, don't know how to use it or how to use it for mapping. On the other hand, uh, you know, I've seen with my own eyes uh, the way that MAST has uh, empowered community members to uh, get interested in new technology and feel that they're providing a useful service to their village. So the question is, um, how uh, are these technologies altering the relationships between different actors? Uh, uh, of course, uh, that's a very uh, a good question. Uh, uh, in Tanzania, of course, uh, the land actors, of course, which is, uh, for instance, the village land is a little bit protected by the government uh, so uh, the land officers, uh, the surveyors, the cartographers, uh, they, they think that uh, they, 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 they are the one who can do and, and, and demarcate and each the certificate. So they think there is no room uh, for community member to participate uh, uh, in this process. And, and this is because uh, they, they are getting a lot of money uh, through this process. So. Uh, for them uh, allowing the villagers to participate, the residents to participate uh, in helping demarcating the end parcels. Uh, it's like uh, uh, they, 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 they feel that they're going to block uh, that, that chain. So uh, uh, we, as, 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 as when we, we design the mobile application, uh, we make sure that uh, uh, it's, uh, it's cost effective and then uh, the, the cost effectiveness can be made by by, by making the villager themselves to uh, to work on it, to use the technologies in terms of demarcation and, and, and education. So uh, we have managed to uh, to train 
the village members, of course, including boys and girls, on how to use this mobile application and they prove it that they can demarcate uh, land parcels and uh, and also the the village itself can can full participate in the process. So, uh, 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 but by working that way, we've managed to uh, to, to 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 open the doors uh, uh, and uh, uh, between the uh, land officers and the villagers in working together to make sure that they uh, they, they reduce the cost in terms of implementation and, and registration in Tanzania. Great, thanks so much, Mustafa. And uh, I, I think this is a great question, so wanted to open it up to any of the other panelists who want to jump in on this. Okay, um, so uh, this next question is a follow-up uh, from the private sector question that was posed to Shreya. Um, so uh, let's see, I'm just, I'm reading this in real time. Um, so basically the follow-up question is that land has traditionally been the realm of uh, NGOs and the government. So how can, uh, you know, if private sector actors are getting involved in uh, the land sector, how can uh, the income from the private sector operations be used to tackle challenges in land administration? Uh, and uh, I, I'll open that up to anyone who wants to take a stab at it. Well, I, I guess I'll, I'll try to answer it if I understand it correctly that you know, in some ways, you know, if the private sector is providing a service and they're getting paid for that service, um, ideally they're taking some of that revenue that's being generated and investing back in to ideally the uh, technology um, and services that maybe that they're, they're providing to their uh, constituency groups. Um, you know, this kind of, again, goes back to, I think, some of the conversation we had earlier in the webinar, but you got to think long term, and that's not only for governments also for private sector actors that you can't just invest once and expect to be able to keep up with technological changes and offer the same quality of services that you constantly have to be investing in your operations investing in research and development to be able to grow uh, with technology grow with the changing needs and requirements of your, your customer base and you know I think that's part of the reason Esri has been successful over the past 50 years is that it's always taken an approach of responding to our users. We're a user-driven company. Um, we invest back in a research development upwards of 33% of annual turnover um, each year. And that allows us to be able to continue to provide you know, world-class technology and solutions to our different um, stakeholders and customers around the world. So. Um, yeah, I just think it's important to, you know, continue to invest, continue to innovate, and continue to fund research and development. Well, on that note, we have just a couple of minutes left in our webinar, so I would like to invite each of our panelists to give, uh, you know, a, a few seconds of kind of final wrap-up thoughts on this topic of technology and transparency. Uh, we'll start with Mustafa then move to Tim, then to Shreya, and then to Milton and Renee. Uh, Mustafa, please. Uh, of course, we as a implementing partners, of course, we do implementing, uh, helping, uh, developing, and designing different technologies. For me, uh, the tag up for this discussion is we have make, to make sure that uh, whenever we have to design is, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is guided by the uh, uh, existing procedures, because existing legal framework uh, as a land registration is concerned, but also we have to make sure that we design the technology that is user friendly that is cost effective to the community we are providing it. That's, that's for me, thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Mustafa. Tim. Yeah, I would say, you know, it's, it was a real pleasure working with New America on Bring together these tech primers because I can say from firsthand experience of working in a tech company that technology is rapidly changing. 
um, that there's new capabilities coming out, it seems like every other week. Um, so being able to kind of boil it down and put it into kind of simple terms in terms of how it can be applied within one particular sector, I hope is useful to the different groups that may be leveraging um, or looking into some of these new, new technologies. So it was a real pleasure working on this with you all and hopefully it was helpful. Well, we share that sentiment. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Shreya, please. No, thank you to New America and SD actually for putting together these uh, really cutting edge technologies. And it's great that the land sector is now getting exposed to these kind of technologies. Um, and you know, just yesterday we were speaking to a government official in Odessa who uh, told us that uh, the only way they could have earlier surveyed all those slums, 200,000 slums, was to use the chain method. And that would have taken like decades, I think, to complete it. And so just, you know, acknowledging how the use of drones allowed them to map 200,000 slums in just a year um, just shows that, you know, we can really move forward uh, on, on this critical issue of land tenure if we start adopting technology. Thank you, Shreya. And uh, finally, Milton and Renee, please. Okay, uh, thanks, Julia. Um, we do most extend your thanks for the opportunity to participate in this uh, very lively uh, discussion, um, informative also from our end. Um, but the final words, I must say that uh, as far as land is concerned, a lot of economic potential remains locked away in land, and that's our experience in, in, in a small and developing state as, as Jamaica is. Um, we see the application of, of technology. We see that as important in, in bringing out the potential that exists and empowering people and giving them the opportunity to make use of the land. Um, and, and the application of technology such as 3D cadastres certainly helped us strengthen on our side. Um, use of genesis is also something that, that is useful. Uh, and it is our intention to, to continue to push the limit in terms of what technology can bring to the table to ensure that there is equity and transparency in, in the governments of land on our end. Um, so there's not really much to add to what Milton said. So I'm ready just to say we're at a wonderful state and time as far as technology is for, for land related issues. We've seen that there are still technologies that are on top and the challenge really is for us to look at ways that we can use these technological advances to help to solve some of the issues that have far-reaching consequences. Wonderful. Well, now it's my turn to uh, thank all of our esteemed panelists who are really coming at this issue from every different angle, from the private sector, from the government, from implementing organizations, uh, from investors. Uh, thank you to the Land Portal for uh, hosting this webinar uh, and putting together uh, a great presentation. And uh, thank you so much to Esri for being a partner to New America in uh, putting together these primers. I hope that uh, these uh, tech primers in this conversation has uh, whet your appetite a bit uh, to explore these technologies uh, in a little more detail and uh, not to be too intimidated of them and uh, see how they may be useful in some of your own work. Uh, so thank you to the audience for a really engaging session and all of the questions. Uh, there were a couple of questions that we unfortunately did not get to. Uh, we will pass those questions on to the panelists and make sure that we email you the answers. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.